then this is a, we're having a great thing, the environmental advocacy group, after having planted uh, native plants at a Habitat for Humanity thing. And now we're gonna teach everybody about native plants. And we're, I'm really excited to have it. Your mics are muted. And it, we want you to ask questions using the chat. Uh, and, and if we have, if we mention a link, we're gonna post it so you'll be able to remember it. I am uh, pretty sure that Elaine is recording this. So uh, if, if you haven't pushed record, do it, Elaine. And, uh, and, and right now, uh, one of the great parts about being in the League of Women Voters is I got reacquainted with my old friend, Betty Siegel, who knows more about native plants uh, than almost anybody except I'm our speaker. So uh, uh, Betty, are you around to speak? I'm here, yes, thank you, Donna. You know, I lived in Meridian Township for 50 years and I only found out this winter that we had a land stewardship coordinator for Meridian Township. And this is because uh, as many people during the pandemic were doing, I was looking at webinars and uh, somebody sent me an announcement of this webinar about removing invasive species. And it was presented by Emma Campbell, um, Meridian Township Land Stewardship Coordinator. So I attended it, it was wonderful. And uh, so that's how it came to be that Emma is with us tonight as the speaker because I heard her present for three hours and I was not bored. <laughs> So originally from West Michigan, Emma grew up in the outdoors, enjoying the lakeshore and working on her family farm. She attended MSU where she fell in love with natural resource management and she graduated in 2013 with a bachelor's degree in fisheries and wildlife. Since then, she has worked hard to improve land stewardship efforts in the greater Lansing area and to educate others about invasive species and native ecosystems. So uh, I wanna say again, before I turn it over to Emma, please don't forget to put your questions in the chat as we go along and then we'll have a chance to uh, have Emma take questions at the end. Thank you very much. All right, well, hello everyone. Thank you for those lovely introductions. I'm very honored to be here with the League of Women Voters. I'm always really happy to find out about these groups of people who make such a difference in the greater Lansing area and in our little corner of the world. So I'm very honored to be here. And I would have to say that I think Betty knows the most about native plants. I've talked to her quite a few times. Oh man. Uh, but uh, I've been in this career for 10 years and that's why I love it because I'm always learning. I do hope that uh, you get to learn something new tonight. So I'm going to share my screen. And please let me know if my volume needs adjusting, anything at any point. Okay, here, now I can't get this to be full screen. All right. Should go to full screen here. There we go. Okay. So as was said, I am the land stewardship coordinator for Meridian Township. And I'm here to talk about uh, the environmental benefits of planting native species. Um, so what I get to do um, at Meridian Township, which I just absolutely love. And I also love this community because we actually have a millage where we get to have um, monies go toward a land preservation program, which is just absolutely incredible. And I get to every day um, make land management decisions and uh, organize volunteer stewardship um, across our 1700 acres of parks and preserves. So I absolutely love my job. A lot of that um, is invasive species management, but another big part of it is uh, planting native species and um, you know, getting our natural areas back on course to where they need to be. I'm not really sure why I can't get this uh, bar out of my, uh, can everyone see that? I'm not sure how to get. No, that's only visible to you. Oh, okay, it just went away, so that's good. <laughs> All right, thank you for letting me know. 
Okay. See, for some reason, I'm having issues with my PowerPoint here. Okay. So um, before we go any further, I just kind of want to talk about some of the resources um, of all the knowledge that we're going to go over tonight. Um, so I've been, you know, I graduated in 2013. Uh, I've been, you know, in this for about a decade now, and I've gone to as many conferences and workshops as possible. I like to do a lot of reading. Um, and one of the books that I'm, I'm bringing forth here tonight is Bringing Nature Home by Douglas Tellamy, which I'm sure some of you have read. And it is just a fabulous book about uh, native plants and, you know, the history of them and insects and all these incredible relationships. So I'm going to source a lot from that tonight, um, as well as from the Autobahn and the National Wildlife Federation, who also source a lot from Douglas Tallamy. He has done incredible work, so a lot of people um, want to talk about that. Uh, the michiganflora.net is the U of M um, herbarium site and it's basically if I find a new species out in the field I look it up there and see if it's native they also tell me how valuable it is or how rare it is and then we have our Michigan natural features inventory which is just such a great uh, powerhouse of um, ecological surveying and just a great place of knowledge so definitely check any of these out if you want to learn more okay so what is a native plant and what is you know there's a lot of hubbub about native plants nowadays which is is great um but what exactly does that mean so like i said i work a lot in invasive species management so we're also going to talk about what that is but native plants have occurred naturally in a particular region or ecosystem or habitat without any human introduction which is important to note because some of the invasive species I'm going to talk about were introduced all the way back in 1860 and they're still an issue. So the big difference here is, you know, a plant can be naturalized because it's been a lot around for a very long time, like common mullein, or some people think of it as lamb's ear because it's really soft, um, but it's still not a native plant. So these plants have been around with the local insects, the local wildlife, and so they've all co-evolved with each other for thousands and thousands, and in this case, in this picture, for millions of years. So I really like this picture because these two species have co-evolved for a long time together. So that is a scouring rush in the background. Some people know it as horsetail, some people call it snake grass, um, but it's been around for about 300 million years. And dragonflies have been around for about 350 million years. So that's a really long time to get to know each other. <laughs> now, I don't really know about their relationship other than I see a lot of dragonflies perch on it when they're hunting, because they're really, really good hunters. They're huge predators in the insect world. Um, but it's just giving you a sense of, you know, these things de develop very intricate relationships with each other, which is what we're gonna talk about why that's so important. You'll notice down here, I do have um, the Latin name of some of the plants in the background. Um, a lot of people know this as Black-Eyed Susan, but I want us to note the coefficient of conservatism. That's something that I get from michiganflora.net. And basically it's a scale from one to 10, and one means that it's very common, and 10 means that it's very rare. So it's just kind of cool to get to know these plants and if they're rare or not, and even if they're common, it doesn't mean they're any less important, but we're just gonna be seeing them more in this part of the state. And I think, there we go. Okay, so let's just talk about first why we should care about native plants. So, you know, what is all this talk about native plants? Why are they so important? And I think it's really important to start off talking about why are plants important? So when we think about plants, they're really, really incredible things. So we could not live without them. Um, they give us oxygen and they also sequester the carbon dioxide that we breathe and give off with our cars. Um, but really the biggest thing going down to our 
the beginning of our existence is that every animal gets its food from plants. So whether they're eating the plants directly or whether they're eating something that eats the plants, we're still getting that energy from plants. And when we think about a food chain, like a lot of us think about a food pyramid or a food chain, but really they're food webs because we realize they're really complex and they don't just go in a straight line. But when we think about those systems, we always see plants at the very bottom. They're called producers. And it's because they can go through photosynthesis and they just have this amazing ability to take the sun and turn it into energy, which is something that we could really, you know, take a note from as we're heading into green energy and all that good stuff. So plants are very, very important as a basis. Our food webs have evolved with them, like we mentioned, um, for millions of years. And so they're very intricate and very deep relationships. So we'll kind of look at, you know, what happens when we mess with those food webs. Um, when we think about all the organisms in the world, uh, plants make up a lot of that. But the next thing that we have a lot of on earth is insects. And that might freak you out <laughs> or it might make you happy. Um, but whether you like insects or not, um, it's really important for us to understand how important they are. And I used to tell my camp kids, because I used to be an environmental educator, that there are about a million insects for every person on earth. So there, so first off, be nice to that ant that you stepped on on purpose. <laughs> and, you know, just remember that they, they make up a large part of our world. And the reason that that is important is because a lot of our insects are the ones that develop really close relationships with our plants. And, you know, some insects, they might be a little bit more general. Maybe they can eat a lot of different plants. But actually, a lot of insects are what we call um, specialized. So they only eat a certain group of plants. And then some insects only eat one plant. So, you know, if that one plant goes away, that's not great for that insect. And the reason that insects are so important is because a lot of animals depend on insects. And, you know, even in our culture, there's a lot of populations of people who eat insects. And there's a whole lot going on about how insects are a new sustainable source of protein. So, you know, who knows what that holds, you know, in the future for us, but, you know, basically they're very important. And so I have over here on the right side, well, it's my right, um, a lot of, you know, pretty big numbers that kind of, you know, show that importance. And so 96% of terrestrial birds rear their young on insects. And when I was reading the Audubon website and it said, it takes about 6,000 caterpillars to raise a chickadee family, just one chickadee family. <laughs> So birds especially really depend on insects. Um, and again, that's part of that whole food web that's really important to, you know, our whole wheel going around. Um, one of the interesting things about um, some of Douglas Tallamy's research is what he has found out about oak species and specifically white oaks. Um, and, you know, in the Northeast United States, um, he's found that over 500 caterpillars depend on oak species. And I, before that, didn't even know there was over 500 caterpillar species. Uh, that's just, it's just crazy to think about. And that is, you know, one subset, one group of trees. And unfortunately, you know, in my line of work too, we're really noticing that oaks are not regenerating like they should. Um, and it's one of the fastest declining ecosystems, you know, in America. And that's a problem when you're thinking about how many insects actually depend on them. So this is all going to kind of tie in more closely, but it's just kind of setting the background for you. Now, something I really want to drive home with this presentation, too, is um, you know, I can't imagine what North America must have looked like when it was just brand new, you know, <laughs> before settlers. 
it just must have been incredible to see all the tracts of land. Um, just absolutely incredible. And so something that, you know, myself as a land manager, I really think about with native gardening is that we can do so much to help the habitat fragmentation that we've created as a human species. And with farming and with housing development, we've taken these large tracts of land that were really ecologically productive and extremely diverse, and we've just kind of chopped them up. And, um, you know, in my, I live in South Lansing, I live by Waldemar Nature Center, and Waldemar's uh, beech maple oak forest is part of a forest that used to extend way beyond Okemos. And, re, you know, but even just thinking of a forest that stretched all the way to Okemos without stopping, um, I think, you know, we kind of forget that that was all one big sprawling ecosystem at one point. And, you know, so the Autobahn numbers are saying that we've lost over 150 million acres to, you know, farmland, to urban sprawl. And that's another thing with farming is, you know, we always see these huge fields with one crop and, um, you know, maybe they change it out every other year, but again, it's only one species. So we're gonna talk a lot about biodiversity and, and why native plants are really helpful for that. Yeah, and I apologize if you hear barking. I have two small dogs and they bark at everything. So <laughs> apologies in advance. <laughs> um, okay, so now that we've kind of covered what native plants are and, you know, just how important they are in the whole scheme of things, um, you know, we're going to talk about what are some of the services that they provide. And, you know, some of the things that they do for us aren't necessarily different than other plants. But the fact that they bring so much more to the table is what really makes them unique. So one thing that native plants really do for us, and remember that native is going to be different wherever you live. So we're talking about native here in, in southern Michigan and really just in Michigan in general. But um, native plants really increase the biodiversity of an area. And biodiversity and just diversity in general in life is extremely important. Um, it creates a much stronger, more resilient system. So I think a lot of us have probably heard that example where if you have, you know, let's say you planted one species in a crop and then you have this disease come through and maybe it doesn't kill the, the crop, but maybe it does. And then you're left with nothing. But if you have a hundred different species in an area and a disease comes in, Maybe it only takes out four or 10 of those species, but then you still have so many more left to keep that area strong. And then there's also gonna be, you know, natural selection going on and they're gonna be adapting to those changes. So diversity is just so, so important for our natural areas. Um, many of our plants are host plants to beneficial insects. And we're gonna kind of go through some examples of um, insects that we know really well that have that relationship. Um, and then a lot of other organisms uh, feed on those insects, like we talked about. Um, I have chimney swifts that fly over my house every night, and um, I've read that they can eat 16,000, a family of chimney swifts can eat 16,000 flying insects in a day. So insects feed a lot of animals. And it makes sense when we think about how long they've evolved together. So they're gonna have this really um, special relationship. Um, something that all plants do for us is that they sequester carbon, which means that they, they basically breathe the exact opposite of us. So we breathe in oxygen and we breathe out carbon and they breathe out oxygen and they breathe in carbon, which is perfect for us because we've kind of created a little bit of an industrial world. We have cars that give off carbon and a lot of other things. So that's really good for us, especially as we're moving into climate change. Um, we really need as many plants as possible. <laughs> and so those places too that really need plants are cities. And uh, plants are keeping our cities much cooler. Uh, cement and asphalt don't do a darn thing as far as runoff and um, heat. So basically they're just gonna reflect heat and our plants are gonna keep everything much cooler. 
Um, we've seen that uh, in the city, the temperature can be 10 to 15 degrees hotter. So it's very important for us to utilize plants in as many spaces as possible. Um, another important thing is that they filter groundwater, which for Michigan is really important. Um, some states really rely on snowmelt for their drinking water, but in Michigan, most of us rely on groundwater. And it's really important that they filter it because I think a lot of us just think we turn on the tap, it's perfect water, it's great, but you know we know that it can really easily be polluted. So we really need all the help we can get with that. Um, the other thing that they really do for the rest of our watershed is that they, you know, reduce runoff. So if you just have, you know, asphalt or cement or in the winter, we put a lot of salt on our roads. And so if we can have salt tolerant native plants that can take that, when we have runoff, it reduces a lot of salt from going into the local streams and lakes, which is really important, along with sediment erosion as well. You know, we think of dirt as totally natural, and so it's fine if it washes into the water, but it can really have a huge effect. It can make the water really turbid and cloudy, and that can even really affect the aquatic vegetation. So there's a lot of incredible things that plants do just on their own, and then the native plants just bring it all in together and just really tie it up in a nice bow and give us so many benefits. So now we're going to kind of talk about, you know, that's all good stuff, all the things that they do for us. But, oh wait, it looks like I have a chat. Should I answer that now or should I wait till the end? We'll wait till the end. Okay, okay. So now we're gonna kind of have a visual here of um, how plants affect our food webs. And you know, we talked about they, they bring in a lot of biodiversity. So this is a super simple food web they can be much more complicated than this and go in many directions. Um, a lot of times the arrows don't just go one way. Um, but even in this food web, we can see that, you know, there's the plants at the bottom here, just like we said, you know, everything really depends on trees and grass and shrubs and flowers. And then we've got our insects and then we've got our insect eating birds and so on and so forth. So let's say something comes in and let's say these trees down here are oak trees. We talked about those are really important and they host a lot of beneficial insects. Um, actually in Michigan, we deal with something that truly does take out our oaks and that's called oak wilt. And oak wilt is very hard to get rid of. Uh, trees are very connected species. They connect with each other through their roots, through um, little fungi, mycelium. And so when one of them gets infected with oak wilts, it's really hard to stop the rest of the trees from getting infected. So it can be really devastating for an oak forest. So let's say oak wilt comes in and messes up our oak trees. So that can be a huge problem because, you know, maybe our aphids are okay or our ladybird, you know, is okay because the aphids are okay, but, you know, that might take out a big portion of our caterpillars, which, could really affect our bird population for that year and certainly would affect the adult population of the caterpillars, which is our butterflies and our moths. So when we think about food webs and plants, especially oaks, um, it's very, very important for us to take care of those, um, those ecosystems and those systems of plants so that we don't have this really drastic cascading effect. You know, because up here, the sparrow hawk it's getting like the last energy from all the plants. <laughs> it's getting energy passed down through everyone. And so that's really gonna affect the sparrow hawk too. And those are some of our predators that we don't have very high numbers of. So it can just have this huge effect that you know, we don't want. So our plants are very important in our food webs. So one of the things that I deal with a lot that really threatens that diversity and really threatens our native plants is invasive species. And I'm sure a lot of people know what this is because it's the poster child of invasive species. Um, but this is garlic mustard. And if we were to walk into a healthy, you know, forest in the spring, we would see a ton of different spring flowers, wildflowers. And it would make up a really diverse carpet of 
trilliums and trout lilies and may apples. I'm sure a lot of people are seeing those right now. They look like tall umbrella plants. Um, but when we get garlic mustard uh, in the understory of a forest, we get this whole mat and it just creates a monoculture of one species. And one of the terrible things <laughs> about any invasive mustard, which they're pretty much all invasive, <laughs> all mustard, and they produce a lot of seeds. So garlic mustard per plant will produce 7,000 to 10,000 seeds per plant. So I always tell my volunteers who get overwhelmed that they're still leaving garlic mustard behind, at least you didn't leave thousands to millions of seeds in the forest floor. So every little bit counts. If you have it in your yard, don't give up, keep picking it. <laughs> This is another example of how invasive species um, are just really affecting, you know, in my mind, it is one of the largest threats to native ecosystems. I mean, just look at this picture here of what an invasive species can do to an area. And we do have a uh, grapevine in here, which grapevine is native but it can be very aggressive. And right now it's just taking advantage of this ridiculous situation with Oriental Bittersweet. And it will just carpet the whole forest. And the bad thing about Oriental Bittersweet is that it will climb and climb and climb. It will climb as tall as the tree is. So it has no limit and it binds really, really tightly around the trunk, like so tightly it, the trunk will start growing over it. Um, so it's not like some of, you know, we have a native species called Virginia creeper and it kind of wraps around the tree, but it doesn't really hurt it. But this vine is really out to kill basically. So it was introduced in 1860 for its fall color, which we can see up here in the corner. And it does have, you know, it's, it's absolutely beautiful, but uh, it's um, not worth the negative effect that it has on the ecosystem. There is a native species uh, called American bittersweet. Um, it can be difficult to tell the difference between the two, but now it's really unfortunate because there's so much oriental bittersweet that they don't even um, advise planting American bittersweet because now they hybridize. And at that point, we don't know which one is invasive and which one is native, and then it can still just get out of control. So it really stinks. Um, and it is difficult to get rid of. Now, this is an oak tree that, um, <laughs> sorry, my dogs are barking. This is an oak tree in Nancy Moore Park in the township. And it has up on the left side here, you can see these vines going up and down. Now, this is a humongous oak tree. It's, you know, as wide as my arms across, it's got a huge crown and, um, Oriental bittersweet can still take something like this down uh, because it is just so persistent. It is so aggressive. And if I hadn't found, I just kind of stumbled across this tree one day when I was doing a survey and I saw this and we went out with, you know, the volunteers and we cut a bunch of the vines off, which are still hanging there. Um, but if we hadn't found it and it just kept going, it would have taken this oak species down. And remember again, how important oaks are um, that, you know, oaks can support. So even though they, you know, we know they support over 500 caterpillars, but that's just caterpillars. There's lots of wildlife species. There's lots of other species that eat those caterpillars. So in the end of everything, oaks can support over 4,000 organisms, which is just mind blowing and amazing. So the fact that this invasive species can just take down this tree kind of in silence in the middle of the woods is really terrifying. And you know, it, it's something that we introduced. So it's uh, it can be very frustrating to work with invasive species, but we need to keep doing that work. Okay, so here's another big threat to our native ecosystems. And we already kind of talked about this with urban sprawl and, you know, farming, how, you know, our ecological landscape used to be just boundless. And a lot of animals evolved with that. 
And so when we look at this, this is a great picture. We look here and we have what they call um, interior species. And so those are species like bears, wolves, um, salamanders, <laughs> they're really different, but um, equally important, uh, cougars, um, animals that uh, need specialized habitats, or maybe their habitat needs a lot of room to happen, or maybe they need a lot of room to survive. So they roam really far um, stretches of land, and it's just really cool. And we get like these big old growth forests, you know, there's a lot of animals that that just depend on those type of habitats. Um, and then we have our edge species, which um, you can see in here, deer and <laughs> rabbits and frogs and beaver. And they can, you know, they'll survive on a little bit smaller space. They are not quite as specialized. And so when we come into an area like this and maybe we decide to farm it, maybe we decide to mine it or build a subdivision. Um, and then we just, we cut it in half. And that's what we mean when we say habitat fragmentation. We just kind of chop it up. Um, we're left with these two pieces and we don't have this big stretch of land anymore. And so then we end up with a, more of our edge species. And when we think of Meridian Township and I manage the deer management program <laughs> in the fall. So I know a lot about everybody's concerns and thoughts about that. Um, we really create that pest problem though you know we create uh these instances where we start seeing more bunnies we start seeing more deer maybe we start seeing a lot of mosquitoes because we're starting to fragment habitat and we're not allowing some of those keystone predator species to come in and take care of business and then we're kind of left with this problem and then we have to manage these species that have now become pests so there's a lot that can happen with habitat fragmentation. And once again, it decreases biodiversity, which we really need that to be as high as it can possibly be. It'll make everything stronger. So again, this brings us to what can we do with our yards to help with this? All right, the last thing that is a big threat to native species and ecosystems is just a simple lack of awareness. And, you know, this is a big part of my job is education and, you know, getting the word out there. Um, and to me, I think it's very uplifting. You know, some people can feel like it's overwhelming or, you know, but to me, I, I see a lot of hope in teaching and spreading the word. Um, this is a scene from near my house. So this is Waldemar Nature Center. And I walk there all the time. And, you know, when we look down this pathway, we think that it looks like a beautiful woodland scene. It's right out of a storybook. Um, but there is something wrong with this picture. So as we're looking down this lane, all of these shrubs on either side are not supposed to be there. And we have just kind of gotten this really distorted view of what a forest ecosystem is supposed to look like. You know, we, we feel like this is normal. And really, these are all invasive honeysuckles, <laughs> which, um, you know, in the spring have nice pretty flowers. Uh, they make a nice fence row. Um, a lot of people plant them for privacy. But the problem is, is that they crowd out a lot of native shrubs like viburnums, high bush cranberry, dogwood, which as I walk this path, I do see a lot of those species, but they're really little. And I just can't help but think, you know, how hard is it gonna be for them to grow up through there? Um, this is also why we're seeing our oak forest decline heavily because oaks, like maples and cherries can grow in a lot of shade. They're very shade tolerant. Um, that's why we see a ton of them in the forest floor. But oaks need a lot of sunlight because, you know, when we think of a big mature oak tree, we see this big crown and that is meant to open up space in the woods. Um, and unlike maple trees, uh, oak trees don't just drop their seeds right underneath them because that's like suicide for their children. You know, they, <laughs> if they drop right underneath them, they're not going to grow. 
So that's why oaks have this really huge uh, community built around them of animals that eat acorns, deer eat acorns, turkeys, blue jays, squirrels. Squirrels are one of the best tree planters you're ever gonna know. And so all these animals help plant these acorns because they need sun. So they designed their seeds to be super yummy and so that they'll be carried away and planted somewhere else. But the problem now is that we've introduced all these invasive shrubs and different you know, flowers that really crowd out that understory and then they don't let any light in. And then on top of that, we've also kind of come into this system where we suppress fire because while well, fire is scary <laughs> and we've had, we, you know, in the news, we haven't seen a lot of great things with fire, um, but it is a natural part of our oak systems. And so there's, there's a lot going on that we just simply aren't aware of. And so we kind of start to think this is a normal thing. The other problem that we're facing is that we go to different stores, we go to different nurseries, and in the springtime, we're all hyped up, we're ready to plant a bunch of stuff, and they're selling these plants to us. And, you know, we want to trust that they're selling us good things to put in our yards. Um, these things are really easy to grow, and they grow really fast, and they're really tough, <laughs> but they are not great for our local natural areas. So I have circled in red a bunch of species that I remove every day and I get paid to remove every day. Buckthorn, privet, barberry, anything that's vinca. Vinca has become a huge issue for me. It gets all over the, the understory of a forest floor and it's really hard to remove by hand. So I end up using herbicide on it. And I don't like having to use herbicide on any of these things. But if I don't, they come back and they come back and they come back. So it's one of those things where we have to kind of weigh a, a trade off. Um, but again, they're being sold to us. So just remember that as a consumer, you hold a ton of power. I know that it seems like we, we don't have a say and we can't do anything, but if we weren't shopping at these stores, there would be no stores. So, you know, it can be uncomfortable to be that person who approaches someone who works at the store, but you know, as long as you're remaining passionate and kind, um, it doesn't hurt to say something because, you know, maybe there's 50 people or a hundred people who step forward and then the store starts to notice, okay, maybe we need to start changing this or maybe we at least need to start educating our consumers about the product. So just remember that you can be a huge advocate for that. <laughs> this is my husband and his little brother who just are standing in front of a huge mountain of privet that we removed. And again, they sell it right at some of my favorite local stores. Basically anything that has Japanese or European in it, make sure that you're really researching it first before you plant it. I am happy to see a lot of good uh, native species on here, but just really <laughs> upset about those invasive species. Okay, so now this is where you can make a big difference. So even a small patch of your space, some of us may have acreage, some of us might only have a little tiny area, but you can make a lot of difference with a small space. So in this area, this is a roundabout um, at the end of Park Lake Road, uh, right on the border of Meridian Township. And we can see there's some butterfly milkweed. There's some coneflower over here. Um, there's some coreopsis. It's a very small space and there's cars driving around it all day. But when I was weeding in here, I found some fun little friends <laughs> who are taking advantage of this super small space. So we've got our monarch caterpillar here who's munching away on the milkweed. And we've got a red admiral who's drinking some nectar. So red admiral caterpillars actually prefer stinging nettles, um, but as an adult, they might drink nectar from another plant. So the monarch is a classic um, host plant, an insect that has a host plant that it's very closely tied with. And they are a really great example because the caterpillar feeds on the leaf, um, the chrysalis on the leaf, the adult hatches, and then it lays its eggs back on the milkweed leaf. 
So it completes its whole life cycle on milkweed. That's why there's been this huge push to plant milkweed, plant milkweed. And there's not just common milkweed, there's a ton of other milkweed species. So definitely check those out if you're wanting to attract some monarchs to your garden. And it's not just monarch butterflies, it's a lot of animals. And this is an imperial moth, which they really like tulip poplars um, and willows and luna moths, um, all these little amphibians, these frogs and salamanders and turtles, they eat the insects that feed off the plants. So there's a lot of um, little organisms who are depending on these, these types of plants. Okay, so how are you gonna bring native species into your yard? So if you do have some space to work with, I moved into my house three years ago. It was highly manicured. The lawn was, uh, there was pesticide used on it and uh, fertilizer. And the driveway was also sprayed with pesticide, which again, I have to use herbicide in my job all the time. I understand the pros and cons, um, but in an inexpensive way to see if natives will come into your yard is to simply just don't use pesticide, raise up your mower deck. Uh, the DNR um, recommends uh, four inches, which is what I cut at. And that allows clovers to come in, maybe some small little lawn plants. I've got strawberries in my lawn that are coming up. Um, and so that can be really beneficial too, just having a lawn that will grow some small little tiny flowers. Um, this is a milkweed, a common milkweed along my fence that it seemed like after I moved in and there wasn't spray applied, it just popped up and it's beautiful. I love it. I see it every year. Last year I had monarch uh, caterpillars on it and it was just easy. It just came in. Um, this is my, from my friends. Um, well, this picture isn't from her yard, but she found, I came over to see if she had invasives in her yard. A lot of my friends make me do that for them. <laughs> and she had woodland uh, or wild blue flocks which has a coefficient of conservatism of a five. So that's a really great plant to find in your yard. But again, it goes back to that time when a lot of our yards were woodlands and then we kind of chopped them up. So if you are seeing woodland species coming in like that, that's awesome and definitely take good care of them because that means they're just naturally in the seeping. This is actually at one of our parks. Um, the guys, our, our grounds crew, uh, wasn't mowing right up against the bank because it was too wet and swamp milkweed popped up, which is a very particular milkweed and it, it doesn't always uh, grow um, in every condition. It likes specific uh, moist soil and it's right along the river too, which is great. So it's a great place for it to pop up. This is another place in my yard. Um, this is fleabane, which is a little native that looks like little tiny daisies. And it just popped up right outside my door by my gutter one year and I love it. And there's tons of insects on it every time it blooms and I just leave it there. And maybe it doesn't look the cleanest, but it's cute and it really attracts a lot of little critters. The cool thing too, is when you let stuff pop up, you know that it's gonna enjoy your soil conditions or whatever is going on there because it just came up out of nowhere. Um, my friend has a tulip tree and we had a lot of little babies come up. We transplanted one by the house. It died, but it sprouted back this year. So just kind of letting things go naturally. Um, sometimes you can get really pesty things and you might have to control them. I've had to do that too. Uh, you can see I've got Creeping Charlie in here, which is a European mint that's all over my yard, but you can get some good stuff as well. All right, so bringing um, in, Bringing natives into your yard with intention is what a lot of us are gonna have to do. And even though I've let stuff kind of go naturally, um, I still am intentionally bringing things in because I've got about an acre of lawn and I wanna get rid of it really badly. <laughs> I like mowing, but I have a family of snakes and bunnies that I get terrified I'm gonna run them over. <laughs> so here is, um, my garden was just all um, ornamental grass and, um, I, of course, I do have a lot of herbs. I have a tea garden. So, you know, I have a vegetable garden. I have a tea garden. Not everything is gonna be absolutely native, um, but you gotta have the things you enjoy. And, you know, those things aren't invasive. They don't escape. Um, 
So we've got some cone flower. Now, an interesting thing about this cone flower is it is a cultivar, which a cultivar is when they take a species and they basically clone it. So the best thing that you can do is get local genotypes, which I'm gonna list a bunch of nurseries at the end that sell local genotypes where they go and they gather seed from plants right in this area, which is the best you can get. But you know, sometimes you see something cool and it's a cone flower or a black eyed Susan and you pick it up. So I also have bergamot over here too. I uh, took out all the ornamental grasses and I got wild columbine, nodding onion, um, this is New England aster, a uh, little blue stem. And so I've got some things blooming at each time of the season, but all my stuff is really small right now because I just planted it uh, last year, uh, black eyed Susans. And then this is the New England aster in the fall. So that's really nice because you can look for certain nectar sources that will help out pollinators all year long and insects all year long. So this will bloom really late um, August, September, October. And sometimes that's gonna save some of those pollinators who are just on their last leg. This year I got a whole flat and I planted a four by 10 garden. I got some New Jersey tea to add to my tea garden. And um, I'm really excited about it. <laughs> this is what the flat looks like. Uh, this is from Designs by Nature and Vern Stevens gives you a whole design if you wanna follow it. And it will show you, um, you know, how to uh, plant it so that you have the highest plants in the back and the lowest in the front. And it is a variety of colors and blooms. So I kind of just put this together so I could see what it would look like in the end. Um, but, you know, if all goes well, <laughs> these are what the flowers will look like when they're adults. So this is a great thing to start out with because uh, Vern just lays it out for you and you just plant it and uh, it's ready to go. So I'm excited for that to mature. And this is just an example of um, why we love native plants. Uh, over here, all the way to the left is Kentucky bluegrass, which is what most of our lawns are. And you can see how tiny the root system is there, just tiny. And then these are all native prairie plants. This is pale purple coneflower. There's June grass. Uh, there's so many cool plants in here and just look at their root systems. There's switchgrass. So think about in the long run what that is going to do to your soil in, in your backyard, because we're talking about, you know, organisms that we can see. But you also have to think about the microorganisms in your soil, the fungi, native plants are just going to benefit all of that. So it's a completely bottom up improvement. So in this, uh, I can send this uh, presentation out, but these are some of the plants that were included in those um, seed flats and uh, just a good start. A lot of these are really sun loving plants, um, but I haven't killed anything yet. So <laughs> they're pretty hardy. Um, they don't need a lot of water once they're established. Um, a lot of them are deer resistant, which is amazing. I live next to several hundred acres and I don't have issues with the deer. I put up that fence for bunnies because bunnies always go after the asters when they come up. So um, I don't have issues with deer, but you know, some people still do. And then here's just some resources. Um, I included the Wild Ones uh, River City chapter. They have an entire list of all the native uh, plant nurseries, which is incredible. And they're incredible areas to, or you know, organizations to support. Um, I get, I listed wild type and designs by nature in, in Ingham Conservation District because that's where I've gotten all my plants, and I just wanted to throw a shout out to them. <laughs> and then, if you do want to get involved, to you know, we just talked about how to plant in your backyard so that you can really bring in all these uh, wonderful organisms and beneficial insects, and that's all in your own backyard, and that's super important. Um, but if you do feel like uh, getting out uh, in the township, if you live in the township um, or in the Greater Lansing area, uh, the Meridian Conservation Corps uh, has Stewardship Saturdays, and this spring we had an event every single Saturday. So uh, I'm not just trying to recruit people, but 
honestly, if you want to learn about invasive species and what they look like, if you want to learn about native species, um, like I said, I work with an ecologist, Steve Thomas, and he's with me at almost every workday, and he can teach you so many plants. It's incredible. Um, so you can uh, sign up at the website listed there. If you do want to learn more about invasive species, um, the Midwest Invasive Species Information Network is an incredible resource, and you can learn a lot from there. And of course, you can always reach out to me. Um, that's what I love doing. I love chatting about this stuff all day. So um, that's what I have, but I will take questions if we have time. So should we do the poll now? I think that's a good idea. That sounds good, yeah. So whoever has the magic ability to put that poll up, why don't we do that? Then everybody can answer the poll questions. I'm going to shut my blind really quick. It's very bright. What a good idea. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so is, uh, are the questions, of, uh, can you see number one? Not yet. No. no? Uh, wow. Uh, I see it on my screen. I, and so okay, maybe I, I see it. I, I just pulled it up. Oh, okay but I don't know. Oh yeah, when you click on polls in the bottom along yeah. all the tools. Yeah, click on polls, okay. Uh, yeah, I did. And it okay. shows in my screen. Yes, if everybody click, clicks on the polls, I think that it'll, everybody's will show up. And what you can do is just scroll down, answer and scroll down. And when you get to the bottom, hit submit. And then uh, uh, we'll, be, we'll be able to display them. Oh boy. So the first question is about uh, your estimate of percentage of native, then how, uh, what's a host plant? If you listen carefully, you were told, uh, yeah. what's the best tree to plant? And I can see that a lot of people were listening. And uh, in terms of a photo, no. Unfortunately, uh, the photos apparently are not showing up. So the words just tell you what it was a picture of. Let's see, can I? Okay. Share screen. Nope, not gonna happen. Okay. Mine just disappeared. I have a feeling that somebody named Donna Mullins just did this. Apparently, a lot of you are named Donna Mullins. I have no idea why. <laughs> um, so, yep, the... Uh, uh, share results. Ah, oh, here we go. Oh, that's interesting. So... 44% of people on this webinar have 10% or less native species in their own domiciles. This means you have fabulous opportunities to add native plants. <laughs> uh, host plant is a plant that has a, spe or a special relationship with an insect species. Yes, that's correct. If you could only plant one tree to support your local food web, the best choice would be oak, yes. We heard quite a lot about oaks. Um, a butterfly is a lepidopteran. Uh, moths and butterflies make up lepidoptera. And the last one was a photo of a caterpillar. And I'm so happy to see that everyone recognizes that a caterpillar <laughs> is not yucky. It's a baby <laughs> butterfly. Yay. It doesn't it matter how we talk about these things. <laughs> Okay, I think we can go to audience questions. Um, Laura, you're going to give us the questions? Right. So we have some great questions coming up. Can you guys hear me all right? Yes. All right. Um, what is the proper way to dispose of invasive species? Ah, uh, that's a very good question. Um, it depends on what invasive species it is. Um, this time of year, we would be 
removing invasive species that are herbaceous so they don't have a woody stem, like the garlic mustard and the dame's rocket. And any of those species, um, you know, when they're really little or like a first year growth, you can just toss them aside. But because I don't trust anything and also because I like to keep track of how much I pull, I bag everything in a garbage bag. And if your garbage bag has a hole, then you can double bag it. Um, there's a lot of different places now that sell biodegradable garbage bags. And so sometimes you have to use a couple of those, but um, mm -hmm. if you are worried about that, you can, you can always use those, but they should be bagged. Um, if they're woody and you're cutting them and removing them, you can always stack them. And then you basically have to keep an eye on that pile <laughs> of stuff and make sure that it doesn't um, self seed. Uh, if you've got a lot of acreage, you can always burn something like that, but uh, not everyone has that luxury. So again, it really depends on what you're removing. All right. Uh, and then next question is, what is the role of deer in affecting the oak population? <laughs> <laughs> Well, like I said, too, you know, we, we've had a really big hand in creating an imbalance in our deer population. So I don't want to just hate on deer a bunch. Um, <laughs> but they definitely do browse our oaks heavily. They really enjoy uh, baby oaks, um, seedling oaks. Um, if you go to Lake Lansing North, uh, which is a beautiful, beautiful park, um, mm -hmm. There are a lot of little oaks that are look like they're regenerating, but really they're about 15 to 20 years old and maybe only up to my knee because uh, deer are browsing them really heavily. Mm -hmm. So deer are really, really holding back our oak regenerating our oak regeneration. Um, so we can, you know, some things that we're working on with that as far as land management are caging some of those in, really keeping an eye on them, but that is a lot of work, so. Okay, thanks. Um, next question is, is there any way to create a prairie without using glyphosate round, Roundup? Yeah, so there absolutely <laughs> is. Um, it depends on how big you're making it. If it's more small scale, um, you can, I know we all do a lot of online shopping these days, so you can save up all your cardboard and you can lay a ton of cardboard down early in the season and kill the grass that way. Or mm -hmm. if you're like my husband, just leave the tarp out on the grass and it just dies. Um, <laughs> And um, another thing I'm doing, uh, we're actually planting two native seed bank gardens at our, at two township preserves. And I'm just getting the biggest, fattest rototiller and I'm just rototilling it up. And then I'm heavily mulching between some of the plants. Now with a prairie, that's gonna be <laughs> difficult if you're seeding it. But um, either way, if you don't go with glyphosate, just be ready to weed a lot, but um, mm -hmm that's part of gardening. <laughs> that's right. There's nothing like a big, bad rototiller. Yeah. yeah. I worked Loving on it. MSU's organic farm for six years, so I'm very used to weeding. <laughs> oh, I, I just have like a little wimpy um, electric one, but it works. Yeah. Um, okay. So next question, how would you balance longer grass for native plants with a shorter lawn for tick management? Ah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I deal with a lot of ticks this time of year living by natural areas. Um, mm -hmm. And I do keep my lawn pretty long. Um, and I do deal with ticks sometimes. <laughs> um, so I would say that um, something that has been effective in a little space of my yard um, is I have started seeding um, fescues and sedges mm. which don't grow very long they only grow about eight inches total but they kind of roll over mm. um and i'm not saying that you won't have tick issues there um but they're definitely not like traditional grass and um a lot of times when we get ticks mm. it's because we we do have you know maybe you're piling up leaves at the back of your property um they you know, really like um, dead grass, 
because I, I have some pretty big grasses that grow at the back of my property and mm. I find them there a lot. Um, so, uh, you know, something that I always tell people is you just really also need to stay vigilant. And anytime you're outside, um, I'm outside every day and I have to check myself every single day for ticks. So mm -hmm. um, you may still run into that problem, but uh, you just have to stay hypersensitive and and really check yourself and um, be aware. Yep. Okay, I, I just have to, this is more of a comment than a question, but I did have to, to bring this to everyone's attention because this is something that's dear to my heart. Goldenrod is, is a powerhouse. It does not cause allergies. Ragweed, yes. it's ragweed, which is less showy. And it usually grows by the, the plant causing allergies. So what are your thoughts on that? Briefly. Thank you for saying that. First that off, I Donna. have terrible <laughs> allergies, I, but I have tree pollen allergies. So it's, <clears throat> but no, I love goldenrod. I let a lot of it grow in my yard last year, mm -hmm. but a lot of our goldenrod is a more aggressive species like tall goldenrod. And I have found that it can have a negative effect on other plants in your garden. It can be um, allelopathic and it can release a chemical. Um, mm -hmm. But in places in my yard where it's far away from everything, I let that stuff come up like crazy because I have counted like <clears throat> 35 different uh, winged insects on one plant before in the fall. Um, so a lot of insects love it. And if you're interested in getting some cool... Um, goldenrod that's not as common um the different nurseries i listed sell a lot of like tall or um not tall showy goldenrod or stiff mm -hmm. goldenrod blue stem mm -hmm. is a cool woodland goldenrod species that is very rare um but it, we have found it in a couple places in the township so i love goldenrod it's awesome <laughs> <laughs> yay okay and then there were some discussions about designs by nature whether it's located locally and and, and a, uh, a participant said that yes it is thank you cheryl um and a few suggestions for uh, michigan wildflower farm for seeds aha yeah. uh -huh. yeah. and then the local wild ones chapter is the red cedar chapter and um and Betty put the that uh, website address in the chat. Uh, then there was a question though: do Do you know if the Wild Ones chapter is having any upcoming events? If well, you knows. just missed our plant sale on Saturday at the Meridian Farmers Market. <laughs> no, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> um, we haven't been having a lot of events because of the pandemic, of course, yeah. like other organizations. But we have been talking about trying to do some outdoor events this summer. So I would say just keep checking the website, see what's coming up. If you remember, you'll also be on our email list. And then um, a lot of times there are links to various free webinars that are posted out and sent out to members. So um, I encourage you to join. Yeah, Wild Ones is awesome. I I don't know I don't know if I grabbed the one from the Red Cedar chapter, but I did put their list of native nurseries. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, they're a great resource. And the farmers market is going to have a few different uh, native plant vendors throughout the year. So just you know, they they post all that on Facebook. Um, so great. And then. Uh, a request for you to tell us more about how you personally got into environmental conservation. Ah, <laughs> you know, that's a question I get a lot. Um, <laughs> and it's not, it was not an easy journey. Uh, it's a difficult field to break into because you have to go through a lot mm -hmm. of seasonal low paying jobs. <laughs> and in the winter time, I always had two or three jobs. Um, but I always had one job, at, you know, outdoors at a park that I loved. Um, but no, I, I re it really started with fisheries and wildlife at MSU. It opened my eyes to land management and conservation biology. And um, I couldn't travel at the time because I had six uh, family members. Mm. And I just kind of paid my own way. And I started doing stewardship um, programs at all the parks I worked at. <laughs> I just kind of started doing invasive management and um, the field work is what got me this job. So if you are someone who's interested in this field, field experience is huge. And schooling is important, mm -hmm. of course, but um, I only have a bachelor's of science and I, I 
I worked a lot of hours outside getting um, that outdoor experience. So, um, yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This was really fun. <laughs> I hope You're I amazing. Didn't ramble too much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Emma. This has been just great. And, and I'm so happy that my Meridian Township taxes are supporting you and your work. That's just wonderful. Yay! I am too. Thank Money you. Money well spent. <laughs> I love working in this township. I just want to say really quick, it's an amazing community. We've already Good. completed 500 hours of stewardship work this year and removed 1,500 pounds of invasive species. So thank you to this community. Um, and uh, I feel very lucky. Actually, um, I do have a quick question about, I, I joined the Conservation Corps. Do you guys ever do any work day, work events that aren't on Saturdays? Because also being in the nature nerd field, I work at Fenner Nature Center uh, on Saturdays. Yep. <laughs> right. We both work every Saturday. <laughs> yes, we do. That's um, part of the job. Yes. So we are actually going to start uh, Wednesday Warriors coming Ooh. up. Um, and then there's a few programs coming out that are going to be a little more individual based, um, like our Bio Blitz Squad and our mm. Waterways Watch. So I'm trying to kind of create some, some things that people can do on their own um, outside of the Vernal Pool Patrol, which we already had training mm. for this year. Um, so yes, but I do want to start doing stewardship during the week when it's warm and well, I'll probably continue into the winter too, because we, we keep doing work in the winter as well. So, but I have had some volunteers ask for that. So I'm putting something together. <laughs> and that's that, if anyone has not checked that out, um, that's a, that's an excellent, you guys have some really cool stewardship programs. Thank they you. They look very exciting. So check it out, everybody. It's been very fun. I've had mm. a great time working for the township. <laughs> I know that everyone has really enjoyed this and I have really enjoyed it, even though, you know, I kill plants for a living. And, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so uh, I just really want to thank you a lot, Emma. Thanks a lot. Oh, thank you so much. I've, I've really enjoyed my time. Everyone has been very lovely and great questions. And um, I'd be happy to come back anytime for anything. So <laughs> wait, we have one more question. Um, is anyone doing plant rescue? Oh, I think, um, what is it? Is it Donna? Did she say she was a plant hospice? But <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but that, um, yeah, that's. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing um, that's from Perry. I think, um, like maybe rescuing plant. I'm just guessing rescuing plants from like maybe. Um, uh, construction sites or, or anything like that, maybe. Mm. I'm not sure if that's right, but. Uh, well, first off, I do rescue a lot of my friends' plants. I have plants all over my house now from them moving away. So I do rescue house plants. Um, that's a great idea, though. Honestly, if anybody, uh, we did dig up some trillium uh, from Hillbrook Park. Uh, that was in the way of construction. Mm -hmm. um, but that was just because somebody told me it was there and it was going to get crushed. So we don't have an ongoing program. But if you think something is going to happen, you can always contact me at the township and me and my crazy plant coworker will come out and <laughs> rescue whatever. So <laughs> excellent. Thank you. It is a great opportunity to get free plants. I was a couple of years ago, I was driving along where there was a lot of New England disaster by the side of the road on Jolly Road across from Okemos High School. And I saw a big construction project happening. Mm -hmm. And I thought, they're going to kill all those asters. So I yeah. pulled over and I talked to the construction guys and I said, do you mind if I dig up these asters over here? And they said, we don't know anything about plants. It's all going to be rock. <laughs> So I madly went several weekends and dug up as many New England asters as I could. And I planted them in my ditch garden by the side of the road because I already knew that they would thrive by the side of the road. And uh, that became a car dealership. So I felt very good about rescuing. Wow. That's so smart. That's great. Ah. Oh, it's the new one on Jolly that's going up, right? Yeah, no, that's uh, a well, great idea. Already. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, and I, 
I forgot to yeah. mention too, but we are starting a, a, a more of a native plant program where we have resources and um, trying to get people in the community to uh, to get involved in native planting. Um, but one of the things we're starting is seed bank gardens. And one of the things we want to do in the future with that is start a seed exchange or a plant trade too of native plants. I've, there's a lot of homeowners like yourself, Betty, who have amazing native plant gardens and they're always offering me plants to put in the preserves. So I think there's some traction there. And <laughs> I always I think that have will... plants to share. Yes. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> So no, I think that'd be a great future program, so. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so thank much. You so Everyone much. have a wonderful evening. And again, thank you for having me on and um, have a lovely evening.